take out our Bibles. Yeah. We're going to begin Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 this morning. Verse number 8. Oh, uh, yeah. I remember one of the teachers we had in Bible college said, if you're losing the people's attention, the way to get back their attention is to make a mistake. <laughs> and everybody gets it. Yeah, you get their attention back that way. All right. All right. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. Your Bibles are out. Amen. Preaching the Word of God. Amen. Let me pray as I start in this morning. We're preaching about a good witness. Be a good witness. Every Christian needs to be this. And I, I believe every Christian has this desire, too. Yes, sir. Desire to please the Lord in this area. Be a good witness. Yes. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. I pray you'll bless me. Help me to preach, Lord, as every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, on Wednesday night too, teaching the lessons of preaching on Wednesday. But help me to preach this morning. That'll be clear. That'll be a help. That'll be a blessing. Maybe to some for illumination to learn something they didn't know before. I pray the Holy Spirit of God will work on people. Give them, give us, us, I'll include myself, Lord, certainly. Give us what we need this morning, please. But help me to preach. Lord, that'll be a blessing. Spiritual applications will be made where there are spiritual needs. For those who are saved, there'll be revival. For those who are not saved, that they'll surrender. They'll understand it. Lord, there's sometimes people just need illumination. They don't need to know things sometimes. So I pray that you'll give them that illumination, the understanding of where they are spiritually, what real salvation is. So please help me to preach. Lord, I always need your, your help and want your help. In Jesus' name I pray and ask it now. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. One of the first Bible verses I learned when I was in Bible college in evangelism class, personal evangelism class. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. Now, the title of the message this morning again is a good witness, to be a witness. What's involved in being a witness? God has called every Christian to be a witness, and we are. And we need to be, and we need to get better at it even. We can even in, increase in our ability to, to teach and witness and to deal with people. But a good witness, to be a good witness. Amen. Uh, I guess a question comes to mind, why witness and about what? About what are we to witness? Five, uh, yeah, five different thoughts here. About what we're to witness. We're to witness about Jesus Christ, number one. Let people know who he is. Number two, we witness about the Bible, too. Amen. Yeah. The Bible being the Word of God. Yeah. We need to use the Bible, show people the Bible. Number three, we need to witness about faith, what it is and what it is not. We need that because a lot of people don't understand the basic things about what faith is. They say, well, faith is believing. But people have different, well, a lot of people have the wrong definition. I'll put it this way. A lot of people have a non-biblical definition of believing. Yeah, because yeah. believing in the Bible has a lot of things that uh, people's general thoughts about the definition of believing is not. So number three, we need to witness about uh, the faith, about faith, what it is. Uh, number four, we need to witness about salvation. Yeah, kind of clear that faith is salvation. We need to witness about salvation, what salvation is. And number five, I think I can include this in this short little list here too. What we need to witness about is about knowing God. That's got to be kind of a popular thing, isn't it? That little phrase, to know God. You want to know God. And so we need to witness to people about how you can know God. And according to the actual words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself says, a person cannot know God unless they know me. They need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you'll not know God, the Father. But only through Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now, talking about it being a, a good witness. It says, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be not Jehovah Witnesses. That's right. Wait a minute, that's not what it says there, is it? I need my fact to check here. It's not good. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. There it is. Unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So worldwide, we need to be witnesses about the Lord Jesus Christ. Who he is, what he did. We need to witness about that. I want to look up two more verses here this morning before we begin my, my main message. But 1 Timothy, 
Yeah, First Timothy chapter six. First Timothy chapter six, verse twelve. There's one quick verse here, dealing with again being a good witness, a good witness. The word good is used in this verse here. First Timothy chapter six, verse twelve says, "Fight the good fight of faith." So salvation, living for the Lord, is really talking about being a fight, a fight. Fight, fight the good fight. It's a good fight, a righteous fight, a faith. So faith includes fighting in the right way, not physical fighting. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. That's what it's all about. How do we get eternal life to another thing we need to know, uh, be witness of. Where do thou art called and hast professed a, a good, there's a my word good, a good profession before many witnesses. A lot of people have seen my testimony and have heard my uh, my testimony. A lot of people have heard that. One more verse I want to look at before we get to the main part. Now, First Peter, First Peter chapter three, verse fifteen. A little further on in the New Testament, there. First Peter chapter three and verse number fifteen. This one you're probably uh, familiar with. First Peter three fifteen says. Uh, but sanctify, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's important. Where do you, you where do you have to have the Lord in your hearts? In your heart. And what the Bible definition of the word heart is, by the way. Uh, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always. Be ready always. Anytime. Always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you uh, with meekness and fear. So we need to have a certain attitude. Two attitudes here, the Bible says. In our witnessing, in our being a good witness, we need to have meekness to realize how important this is, but to have a, a meek quality about us, not a, a proud, uh, proud kind of attitude. Right. Meekness and fear, realizing how serious this is. Good. Christianity is serious. Amen. Where people spend their eternities is serious. Because right. once you're there, you're there forever. How, what a solemn thought that is. Oh, yes. We yes. need to reach people now Amen. before it's too late. Amen. So meet this and you have the right attitude to meet this and have a solemn attitude, a serious attitude. This is important. What we do in our church is important. Amen. Christian, what you do is important. Important. So meet this and fear have those right attitudes. So a good witness. All right, number one, how to be a good witness. Number one, you need to know what you believe. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Ephesians 4, 14 here. Uh, know what you believe. Know what you want to say ahead of time. Kind of plan a uh, certain method or certain ways or certain things you want to say uh, when you talk to people. Like I told you before, uh, one thing I use quite often is very simple. Just ask, well, do you go to church somewhere? Oh, by the way, let me say this too. Also, we have this old saying in our church. I heard this probably from the first year I got to say. It said this. First of all, to win them to the Lord, first of all, you have to win them to yourself. Yes. That's a, you know what that means? That means you need to kind of be friendly yourself and get them to kind of like you first, and then what you have to tell them will be much more readily accepted. When they see that you've accepted them and you're kind of a, a nice person, friendly person, and they generally kind of start to like you, then what you have to say will be much more readily received by them. Yeah. So understand how are you going to deal with people? How are you going to talk to them? You know, if you can smile, you got a nice smile. Use that smile for the Lord. Yeah, use that smile for the Lord. Talk to them in a friendly way. Just be friendly with people. And then tell them, get them on that subject if I talk about the church. But first of all, you have to know what you believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ today? If you don't, don't witness to people. That's right. Do you believe in the real biblical salvation? If you don't believe in real biblical salvation, don't go around witnessing to people. Amen. Uh, don't witness the people of your questions and your uncertainties and your dilemmas and your problems. And don't go around criticizing Christians and criticizing the church. Know what you want to say. Keep it on that level because we're trying to reach people for the Lord and we want to be a good witness. Amen. Know what you believe. Right. Know what salvation is. Know, know what your church believes. Yeah. So if you're going to invite them to your church, make sure it's a good church. Amen. So first of all, know what you believe yourself. Are you sure about your salvation? It'd be hard to witness to 
somebody and say, well, you need to believe in the Lord so you can know for sure you're going to heaven someday. That's a good way to say it. But what if they ask you, well, are you sure you're going to heaven someday? And what do you say? Well, I'm not sure about it. I'm hoping I'll make it. And we need to know what we believe. So we can be certain in our witnessing to them. People are looking for someone who knows what they're talking about. Amen. Every time you get a, maybe work done on your house or something, you always try to get a couple of um, people out to give you their their thoughts on things. I found the more people you about, the more confused you get. But anyways, you want to find somebody who knows what they're talking about. You want to find somebody who says, oh, I know exactly what you need. I've done a dozen of these before. I know exactly what you need. I can take care of it. I want to hear somebody talking that knows what they're talking about and has that kind of a confidence and that kind of assurance. So know what you believe when you witness to people. And I believe our people in our church do. But that's point number one, to be a good witness. Know yourself what you're talking about and be sure of that. Number two in my outline today. Well, Ephesians chapter 4, yeah. Let's read that, verse 14. I sometimes get so worked up in my preaching, I forget where I am. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, yes. That we henceforth, henceforth from now on, be no more children. The Christian can't, can't be in a spiritual children here. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with everyone that God. You know, people aren't sure what to believe. They're, they, they hear about this and then somebody comes along and they tell them something different and they can't defend themselves. They're thrown by everyone to doctrine. They hear about different churches and what they believe and think, well, that must be right. Or they see somebody on TV, yeah, watch. Be careful of people on TV. Uh, they might throw you the wrong way. You need to find out what people believe. But it says here, children are tossed about with everyone to death. They're children, spiritually being in that age group. A spiritual child is tossed about with everyone to death. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they, they lie in wait to deceive. They're waiting for you. They're looking for you. Don't be one of them. Don't be one of their victims. So you need to know what you believe. Not talk about with everyone in the doctrine that comes along. All right, now number two. Let's go to number two. Reveal the news in the Bible. Uh, now this, these verses you know. Everybody knows Romans 10, 17 without even turning there, don't you? Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So then faith cometh by hearing. That's how you get faith. But turn also to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Another well-known verse here that we bring up in our church pretty often, but I want to read it again. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Talking about salvation here. Using the Bible, using the Word of God. See, when we use God's Word, it is our authority. That's why we can speak like we know what we're talking about. That's why we can talk about salvation and talk about people that are saved or are not saved. The Bible has an authority in back of it. God's authority. Whose Word is the Bible? God's Word. What an authority... You can't go to a higher authority than God himself. So we use God's word. This is authority right here. And when you use this Bible, you're using the authority of God himself. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 now. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 says, And that from a child, Timothy, thou hast known the holy scriptures. I like that word holy there. Not just scriptures, but holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. What gives wisdom about salvation? The Holy Scriptures, the Bible. Able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, believing the Bible, which is in Christ Jesus, believing in Jesus Christ. And then verse 16 also is connected here, isn't it? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Every single bit of it. Inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, not sinless, but perfect, in the meaning of that word perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 
The Bible will refine you. The Bible will help you. The Bible will educate you. The Bible will furnish you uh, everything you need spiritually. Spiritually. All good works. People have a, you know, mostly, many people do have respect for the Bible. You, know, you talk about the Bible, you bring it up, or you have a Bible, or show them some Bible verse. Many people, most people have a kind of a respect for the Bible. I'm not saying they're safe, but they have respect for the Bible. And if you bring the Bible up, because maybe they went to some church that used the Bible, maybe they didn't preach the right gospel out of that Bible, or maybe they had the wrong Bible. But the Bible does get some respect for a lot of people. They'll have kind of respect for it. So know the Bible. Amen. When you use the Bible, even quoting a Bible verse, that will get their attention. It always amazes me when you show them the actual verse in the Bible. Maybe you just have like a John Romans book or something like that. You show them how that gets their attention. It fixes their attention on that Bible verse. Whatever verse you're showing them, it makes a difference. There's a power in that when they see the Bible itself. There's a power there. God's power. The Holy Spirit of God's power there using that. People have respect for the Word of God. So here it says here, how do you know the Word of God? How do you know it's salvation? Through the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures. You need to know the Bible. In our witnessing, use the Word of God. Yeah. Amen. It is good to quote verses. That gets people's attention. Once in a while, I have a chance to quote a verse to somebody. And you can tell that their attention is locked in with what I just said. Yeah. It's exciting. It's encouraging. I wish they'd follow up on it more. I wish they would. Yeah. But when you use the Bible, there is a power there. There is an authority there. That's God's authority is the Word of God. The Word of God. And like I said, even, even generally people have respect for the Bible somewhat. Some don't, of course. And that's what you may be changing to. It's like you have respect when you see somebody famous somewhere. Maybe you're out shopping, you see somebody that's been on TV or somebody, uh, somebody famous. There's a respect there. But when you use the Word of God, what a power that is. What a power that is. How to be a good witness. Number three, have boldness. Have biblical boldness. Acts chapter 4. Turn back to Acts chapter 4. We need to exude confidence. I like that word, exude. I mean, it just has to be pouring out, out from us to have that kind of boldness and confidence. Now, let me say this, too. It is a little scary to witness to somebody. It's a little scary to talk about the Bible, talk about spiritual things to somebody. Uh, there's a natural nervousness we have, and that's okay. But push yourself beyond that. Because I have noticed as we grow and learn more and more about the Bible, the boldness grows in us, too. Acts chapter 4. Talk about the apostles here. The boldness that they have had at this time. Now they had been with the Lord himself. They had gone through a lot of things. Peter himself, you know, in three and a half years he was with the Lord. The times he fumbled around and stumbled around spiritually, but he finally got it right. Acts chapter 4, verse 1 says, And as they spake unto the people, the priests, and the, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came unto them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That resurrection is brought up so many times, isn't it? Now verse 3. And they laid hands on them, put them in hold, and the next day, for it was now even time, thus they put them in prison for doing that. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, believed. And the number of men was about 5,000. Well, that's a lot of people to see saved. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes and, and the high priests and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and many were, and many as were of the kindred of the high priests were gathered together in Jerusalem. So a lot of people were there, a lot of their relatives even, it says. And when they had sent them in the midst, they asked, by what power? It's an interesting question. By what power? Meaning authority. Who told you to do this? Who told you to do this? By what power? By what authority? Or by what name? Mm -hmm. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting. They understood this part of it, didn't they? By what name have you done this? Who said you should do this? Who told you to do this? Who are you obeying? Who are you serving here? By what power? Or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, 
Okay, good, Peter. Thank you, Peter. God really used you. Yeah. I kind of embarrassed some of the previous chapters in the Bible there, in the New Testament and the Gospels. Uh, some of the things Peter said, some of the things Peter did. But now look at what Peter's doing now, though. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Christian, don't worry about what you did in the past. Uh, maybe a little weak or something. Serve him now. Amen. Don't worry about it. Don't let the past discourage you from serving him now. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, the healed, uh, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ give the Lord the glory, Amen. by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified. Let's stop there for a minute. Yes. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Remember what you did to him? Is what they're saying. You crucified him. And by his power, we, we healed this man, whom ye crucified, when God raised him from the dead, resurrected again. Even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Because of Jesus Christ, we were able to heal this man, the one you crucified. Verse 11. This is the stone which, is, which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Now, go to verse number 13. Verse 13. Well, no, no, let's not skip verse 12. Amen. Let's not skip verse 12 here. Neither is there salvation in any other. That's right. I have that underlined in red in my Bible. Underlined in red in your Bibles, too. I suggest you do that. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness, what, Peter, what was Peter just doing? He was giving a witness. Telling them that the one who they crucified, resurrected from the dead, and that's where they get their power, they, that's where they get their authority, and he is the one who sent them out to do these things. Yeah. Christian, when you witness, it's the Lord Jesus Christ himself yeah. sending you out to do those things. Yeah. Now, when they saw the the boldness of Peter and John. That's what I'm talking about. Christian, we need the boldness. And perceive that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They hadn't gone through their colleges and their schools. They marveled. They marveled. Amen. And they took knowledge of them. They remember that. They thought about these things. It caused them to start thinking about these things. That's another job we have as Christians. To get people to start thinking about salvation. Right. And start thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. To get them off the subject they might be thinking about. To get them on the train of thought. Get them thinking about Jesus Christ. Get, get them on track. You might have that track on uh, the road to heaven. Get them on track about salvation. The knowledge of them that they had from Jesus. And the holy of the man which was healed standing with them. They could say nothing against it. What could they say? What excuse could they come up with? They couldn't deny a thing. They were on the spot, weren't they? The boldness of both. Friends, truth is bold. Truth is bold. Truth never backs down. Now, we might at times. We can never back down. But truth is bold. Truth never backs down. Truth is not, by the way, truth is not, it's not pushy either. Truth is not pushy, but it can be. You know, I guess it, you could say it can be. Just ruined my little thought here. Uh, but it's not pushy to the, in the wrong way. It's not brash in the wrong, not brash. It's not egotistical, but it's true. Yeah. And it's bold. They have that kind of bold, a loving kind of bold, speaking the truth in love. Amen. Speaking the truth in love. Yeah. So having boldness, that's a good witness. When you speak with boldness about these things. I, you know, all these people that go on, you go up, give me out trash. It takes a certain kind of boldness to give up a track, doesn't it? Yeah. You have to fight beyond your fears. That's right. Because a person is bold doesn't necessarily mean there's no fear at all in them. But the boldness is stronger than your fears. Because what you have to say is so important. Amen. Yeah. It's so important. Right. Point number four, good witness. What do we have so far? Good witness. Know what you believe. You're not to talk about whatever you can win the doctrine. To use the Bible, the Word of God, that's an authority. You have 
God's authority that you know. Brazil is the Bible. There's a boldness there, but you know the truth. There's a boldness there. Number four, you need personal purity because the world uh, and the world's peoples are looking for faults in you. They don't like what you're telling them, or at least some people do. Maybe most people don't like what you're telling them. And so they're trying to find uh, a justifiable reason to criticize you. A justifiable reason to try to criticize you or something because you make them feel guilty or something. First Peter chapter three. Let's turn to First Peter chapter three, verse sixteen. You need to have personal purity, where they can look at you and find nothing wrong with you. Now we know as Christians, we're not perfect. There's no such thing as a sinlessly perfect Christian. But there's a big difference between justifying sin and living in sin and working towards the salvation and working towards. The, the uh, purity that we need to have. But 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16 says, Having a good conscience, yeah. that whereas they speak evil of you, yes, sir. when they criticize you, as of evildoers, yeah. they speak evil of you because they're trying to find something in you as as evildoers, now we see that happening in our country today too. People that are doing right are being criticized. That they're the problem. People that are trying to do right in this country in different areas, different ways, they're being pointed at and accused that they're the troublemakers and they're the one. They're the cause of all the problems and these things. It's just it's happening, isn't it? Yes, yes. Let's go back here. I want to keep on my main thought here. Speak evil of as evildoers. As evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Yeah. When they really think about it, they're confronted with it. They're going to be ashamed because they can find no fault in them, mm -hmm. like the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Also, First Peter chapter two, back at chapter two, verse twelve. So we need to be living right. Now again, there's where the sinless perfection comes in. We're not teaching that. But 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12 says, Having your conversation honest, honest among the Gentiles, yeah. those who are not saved, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. When that time comes, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, they're to be confronted with their accusations and their false criticisms. And we, you are going to be glorified when the Lord comes back. What a difference when the Lord comes back. Yes, sir. Submit to yourselves to every word of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the King of Supreme. talks about our relationship in this world and the authorities in this world that God has set up to. But verse number 13, having your conversation, your behavior, honest, where? Where? Among the Gentiles. Amen. Not just in church. Out there, too. And whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, they're going to see you doing what's right. They're going to have a hard time finding ways to criticize us, to criticize you, which they shall glorify God in the day of visitation. Personal purity, to silence the critics. When they know they're wrong and they feel guilty about that, and the Bible word is convicted about that, and they feel convicted about those things, they're going to try to find some way to ease their conscience. And one way to ease their conscience is to find some fault uh, in you, Christian. They'll feel a whole lot better. If they can find some, or something in you that they can point at and look at and see, they'll make them feel better because they know they're not where they need to be. That's right. And so they try to raise themselves up by breaking you down. Right. Mm -hmm. So live a good life in front of them. Yes, if there's things that are wrong, make those corrections, Christian. Be a good witness. A good witness. So personal purity is number five. Another thing is faithful in spite of others. Faithful in spite of others. First Corinthians chapter 16. We'll go around here again there this morning. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. Others. And we're talking about non-Christians, but we're talking about Christians too. Being faithful no matter what other people around you are doing. Even if people have disappointed you, 
Yeah. I'm using the words, I think I have in the outline there in the bulletin. There's antagonists, there are critics, and there's adversaries, one of the verses says. And there are hypocrites. There are hypocrites too. Don't let others discourage you. One of our missionaries, one of the wives of the missionaries here, several months ago it was now, she says, you know, I'm doing kind of a paper about for pastors and encourage them and talk about them in my life as a you know, pastor's wife too. What would you say if you were to give one thought to young pastors? She asked me this question. If you were to give one thought to young pastors, what would you say? Because just one thought you had to bring up. You know what I said? I might have mentioned this before. I said this, I said, don't let people discourage you. Then she looked at me, she says, you know, others have told me that. But she said, do you really want that to be your number one thought there? She's trying to get me to change, I guess. I, I mean, she didn't like hearing that. And I said, no. Christian, don't let people discourage you. That's right. That's right. You serve, remember this, it's so important to remember this, Christian, please. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Amen. He will never discourage you. That's right. We need to have a certain amount of respect for each other as Christians, yes. Uh, we need to look, be able to look to each other. As Paul says, uh, uh, be, be followers of me, even as I am of the Lord. Yeah, I know. I know. That's right. Paul could say that. But he says, even as I am of the Lord, follow my example. We need to live that way, too. But there's times people might discourage you. Oh, yeah. Don't let people discourage you from serving the Lord. Yeah. They might discourage you at times. May I say this too, though? I think we have a good church. Yes, we do. People don't discourage me. They, you, you encourage me in that church. Yeah. Thank, I hope I encourage you too. Yes. Yes. I want to encourage people to serve the Lord. I hate to stand before the Lord someday and have to give an account, not for my sins, of course, not for my sins, but I, I discourage people. Yeah. Oh, I don't, want, I don't want that to be on my account. Yeah. Not at all, not at all. Yeah. But again, people can do that. Failures of others sometimes, and we have to kind of uh, watch over that. Failures of other people. Uh, there are antagonists, there are adversaries. There are certain, certain loot fellows of the base or sword, as it says here in Acts. And there are hypocrites. Yes. Yeah. Don't let people discourage. Don't let people keep you from coming out to church. That's right. Amen. Don't let people keep you from reading the Bible. Amen. Don't let people keep you from witnessing the people. Right. Be careful of that. Keep your eyes on the Lord. He will never discourage you. Amen. And when you find yourself getting discouraged, you can always ask yourself, who did that to me? Who did that? Who discouraged me? Who discouraged me? Get your eyes on the Lord. When you get discouraged, turn your eyes on the Lord. And realize He wants to continue to work with you. He will always encourage you. Even the Lord had to deal with His disciples. Was that easy? Difficult? Or otherwise? There were times it was difficult. Even the Lord mourned. Not mourned, but he, he uh, thought about those things. And he kind of, he has a word, grieved him. Grieved him. Yeah. Yeah. Faithful in spite of others. Don't let others discourage you. Don't let others make you mad, angry. Don't let others depress you. No, don't let that happen. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Faithful in spite of others. That's a good witness. Number six. Faithful in spite of personal inconveniences. Inconvenience. Did I not read that verse? I am having a little bit of trouble. You pray for me. I'm doing the best I can. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. I didn't want to read that verse. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. All right, verse 9. It says, For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. And how many believe that this morning? Say amen. 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 There's many adversaries. All right, so don't let others discourage you. Look to the Lord, especially at those times. Now let's go to the next one. Revelation. Uh, uh, I got a couple good ones here. First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, verse 14. The next one is faithful in spite of personal inconveniences. Personal inconveniences. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. Yeah, 14. 
First Peter chapter 3, verse 14, it says, But and if you suffer for righteousness, say, Happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror. Some people will try to scare you with getting angry with you. Be not afraid of their terror. Neither be troubled. 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 But sanctify the Lord God in your in your hearts. Make sure the Lord is there in your hearts in that way. But again, verse 14. But if you suffer for righteous sake, happy are you. Let there be a joy that realizing you are suffering what the Lord did too. Not to his degree, but you are too. So in personal conveniences, Christianity is right, but it's not always easy. Or as one man said, Christianity is too important to be easy. Isn't that good? Christianity is too important to be yes. easy. Right. So realize it's not going to be easy life to serve the Lord. It wasn't an easy life for him living here when he was. But personal inconveniences, just stay with it. Just stay with it. Family, friends, uh, people out there in the world, people you work with, people you meet in the neighborhood, people that you know, your old friends, don't let them discourage you. And realize there will be personal inconveniences to serve the Lord. Every inconvenience we go through to serve Him, we have a greater reward coming for us. If it was easy serving Him, uh, what kind of reward would we deserve for that? That's right. It was easy, but it was difficult. But it's a little hard, a little more hard to serve Him. That's where the rewards really come. The harder it is, the more difficult it is. We stay faithful in those times. We'll receive our rewards for doing that. Amen. Revelation chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 10, talks about being faithful unto death even. Even, even to the point of death. And let's get to the last one this morning too. The last thing to be a good witness, to be sincere. Yes. Sincere. Philippians chapter 1, verse 10. <laughs> Philippians chapter 1, verse 10. To be a good witness. We, we need it more now than maybe ever. I don't know. I don't know. We always need good witnesses though. We always need to be have people that are faithful to the Lord always, always, always. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 10. It says here in Philippians chapter 1, verse 10, that, that ye may approve things that are excellent, not just good or very good, beyond very good, excellent. That ye may be, there's our word, sincere, and without offense to the day of Christ. Well, if we're to be sincere, what does it mean to be not sincere or insincere? That means that some people are serving the Lord, some people are serving the Lord for the money. Yeah. You know anybody like that? Yes. See anybody like that? They're in it for the money, for the money. That's not sincerity. No. That's hypocrisy. That's selfishness. That's self-righteousness. Not for the money. Number two, it's not for the self-glory. They yeah. have a big crowd out there and honoring, glorifying you and Raising you up, not for the self-glory. The Lord lived his life a very humble life, didn't he? Not for self-glory. They'll be insincere. Sincerity serves the Lord no matter what we have to go through. Sincerity serves the Lord. It's not for money. We're not getting money out of it. We're not getting self-glory out of it. Some people want to come to church because they've got some kind of problem, maybe family problems and physical problems and Financial, even financial problems too. Yeah, that's all right. Come out to church, but but that's not why we're here. Right. We're here to present the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you, we have Him, and you know Him in the saving and the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, all the other things take on a whole different glow. Yeah. You know, they, they take on a whole different importance. They're still there. We still have to go through some of those things. But now we're doing that with the Lord. And what a difference that is. Imagine, imagine facing all your problems if you did not know the Lord. What difference would that be in your life? What kind of difference that would be? So sincere, yeah, we're not in for the money. Uh, we're not here for self-glory. Uh, we're not doing things half-heartedly. We're doing things completely for the Lord with all our hearts. Be sincere. Again, Philippians chapter 1, verse 10, that he may approve things that are excellent, to do the best we can for the Lord, that he may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that when Christ comes back, we can be insincere and we can be offensive. 
It means when he comes back, things are going to be so different. We're not going to have the old nature anymore. What a difference that's going to be when he comes back and we're in that eternal state. And we rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ for those thousand years. And then begins the, the, that part of eternity after the thousand years. We're going to be with him forever. Forever. Amen. What a day. Amen. Now, what's the problem? Sin and people's love for it. They fight a holy God. Yes, sir. They fight God. They don't want him. Uh, they don't want him ruling over them. Right. They'll do a few outward things insincerely. They'll come out of the church insincerely. They read a little of the Bible insincerely. Maybe listen to you, Christian, insincerely. But that's as far as it goes. Yes, sir. But to really know the Lord Jesus Christ, what a difference it is. So number one, Christian, we need to be a good witness. The things I mentioned this morning, I could add more things to the list probably. But think about these things. Be a good witness yourself. The Lord needs people. Yeah. What was that time in the Old Testament when the Lord lamented? There was, he looked for somebody yeah. to stand in the gap. Right. Yes, and what did he say after that? I couldn't find anyone. No man, yeah, thank you. No man, no man would stand in the gap. The Lord needs us. He's chosen to use us. Let's be usable. That's right. Let's give in to what he wants us to do. Amen. Let's be submissive and obedient because that's where the, the blessings are Amen. in serving Him. What an important work we have to do. Be a good, good witness. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we come to this prayer now, Lord, I pray we will be good witnesses. That the things I mentioned this morning that could cause a problem or stop that, I pray, Lord, we'll be aware of those things, maybe more than we ever have to. Because I believe we have a, people here in our church that are being good witnesses. Huh? I want that to continue and even improve, Lord, even get better. Even better, better, better. So, Lord, bless now. May people consider these things I brought up today. And also, Lord, for those that, again, have a spiritual need yet of salvation. I, I pray you open up their areas. Some of them just blind their eyes. Yeah. They need to see things. They need to understand things. And only the Holy Spirit of God can do that. So we pray that the Holy Spirit of God will work in their lives. Give them illumination. Give them understanding. And even where they're resisting, Lord, we pray they'll continue to work in their hearts and work in their lives. Whatever it takes to get them saved wouldn't be too much. That's right. right. Whatever it takes. So bless now as we have this invitation time, Lord, please. Uh, help us as Christians to come forward, maybe pray about things. Or maybe somebody walking down this morning to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and submit themselves to him. Believe who he is and what he did and what he wants to do with them. In Jesus' name, now I pray and ask it.